Hey, Christian. Hey, how's it going? Uh, first question, who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name is Christian Escobar, and I am a mix engineer, recording engineer. And today we're set up at Electro Kitty Sound Studio. Uh, this is one of the main spaces you work out of, right? Yeah, mostly here and my own mix space at home. Uh, so I'm curious, what... Uh, like, what are the major differences between these two studios you work out of? And would you, based on different projects, would you want to choose one over the other? Um, so I have had a majority of my work here at Electro Kitty. Um, so generally our rates are between like four to six hundred dollars a day. And so when... Bands. A day being like 10 hours or what? Yeah, 10 hour days. And so so depending on what artist's budget is for the records, um, I try and do as much as I can here. And then if they just don't have the budget to do mixing, I'll, I'll do mixing at home for a lower rate. You know, And that's kind of how it, it's worked um, for the most part. Yeah. And you feel like you can accomplish everything at home that you do here? Or is there a certain gear that you would prefer to have at Electro Kitty that you want at home uh yeah i guess so i we have a lot of nice analog gear here you can't see it but it's on on this side and well i guess you can see this but we have a lot of nice analog gear here and the plugins don't quite match up to it i can get it close but it, it is different it's just um but i do have a lot of cool gear at home i have a lot of plugins i have like i have all of them <laughs> i, I want to ask him about him a bit but uh First, I, we, we just spent a few hours working together. Uh, you, me, and my bandmate, Jesse, we were here tracking some guitars. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm curious about the kind of fine line between being a recording engineer and being a producer. Because as we're working today, you're kind of coaching me through the playing and trying to find the right tone. Um, yeah, can you talk, what is the difference between, in your mind, being a producer and a recording engineer? Just, you know, getting the right take versus adding creative input to a project right well generally um th we don't really have that producer engineer tag team duo sometimes you do and and if the budget is there um they will have that and there will be even like producer engineer and then assistant engineer type situation um so since it's just me or an en engineer producer um i'll generally talk to the bands the bands generally like the main producer and if they just need creative input or a second year then i'll give my opinion or thoughts on that and yeah and that's and, and and do you enjoy doing that like would you ever be interested in just producing without the quote-unquote dirty work of the engineering i feel like it is it's kind of become so intertwined that it's hard to take it out of the other thing i mean like even when i'm just hired as an engineer i feel like i'm I'm pretty I'm pretty strict about it as far as like getting the takes. I want to get like as good of takes as we can get in the allotted amount of time. And so I I, I let the producer slip in there and like I try and get as good of a take and you know, as cool of a take as I can every time. So sorry, I feel like I kind of lost the question there, but No, you totally answered it just kind of Yeah, it they're it's hard to distinguish they're, they're, what one it's is from the other. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I've heard other people say that there's a... Do you know the local um, recording engineer, Kevin Suggs? He does a lot of the work at KXP. He's their main yeah. live engineer. I don't know him personally, but I've heard his name for sure. Right. He, he had a quote saying that like 75% 70 of my job is just getting along with the band. <laughs> uh, like yeah. I, I can have all the greatest gear and know how to get the killer sounds, but if folks don't feel at ease with me they aren't going going to record well have you had personal experience with that where you're just not vibing with the band and 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 that makes itself known in the music um no i generally get along with everyone i think i think that's kind of one of my my plus sides um but i i can totally understand that code i think when you start engineering or when you're first starting to engineer um i think you do kind of like get so excited about all the gear and like you're like oh this neve or that api or oh ssl is the best you know you, you kind of get into that gear sluts mindset where you're like you're so infatuated by the gear that you forget that it's about the music it's about 
you know, the emotions of the music and, and it doesn't like, it doesn't really matter if it's an API or an Eve. So yeah, I, I agree with that where it's like, it's not that it's you, the musician, it's like what you're playing. It's how you feel when you play and, and how we can make the people that are listening feel that same way. So when you are working with people, is it, do you often have some personal experience where you know the band or artist that's playing with you or or like what's the breakdown i'm sure some people you work with you've had a relationship and some just hit you up and say hey i want to work with you and you don't know them so you're strangers when you start mm, with electric kitty i so there's two engineers here it's garrett reynolds who's the head engineer and then i kind of fill in the blanks for him when he can't take a project or he's off doing another project um and so through electric kitty i'll get gigs just people i don't know and and it's just kind of random, whoever calls in, cold call. Um, I get clients by, yeah, just through friends. And, and I go to shows a lot and just try and meet bands because I enjoy So you'll music. go up to a band you like and say, hey, are you guys looking to record? I'm your guy. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, that's the, that's the idea. But I feel like, you know, two out of ten bands will respond to that like, yeah, I, I need to record. Let's do it. You know, it's generally never. That's a pretty good ratio. Two out of ten. Okay. Yeah, sure. I guess. Yeah. It, it, it just just firing blank shots. That, yeah. Yeah. I would say two out of ten will be like, oh, yeah, actually, I do need, need to record. And, and then I can't even give a, a ratio. But oh, you'll, you'll like start emailing with them and then it falls through. So the rate gets a little lower. Right. Exactly. Sure. Right. 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 Exactly. It, it, it'll drop off. But yeah, it's it's a lot of cold cold calling i guess just going to bands and telling them you like them but really i don't i don't do that that much where i'm like hey i just met you like this is great like let's record and maybe that's a fault of mine i guess maybe people do do that and get more work but i try and be a little more like only do that if i really like the music and if i really want to work on it and i think It'll be cool to work on together. Do you have people doing the same to you where they'll cold call you to say like, hey, I found you mixed this person. I love the way that sounds. Uh, can we meet up and work together? Um, No, not really. Not mm -hmm. really that often. Did you have a website where people can like hear like sample work or get in touch with you? No. That'd be a good first step. Right. Yeah, totally. Well, okay. So here's the thing. I've been doing sound engineering since 2009. Oh, okay. And I I told a client this the other day that from like 2009 to 2010 I was like pretty crappy and then 2010 to 2013 I was like getting better and then 2013 to 2017 was like okay, now I'm figuring this out. And I would say probably in the last year I'm starting to feel like okay, yeah, I have a really good idea of what's going on. I I have a good ear set but i will say that for the majority of the time i've been doing live sound so i was doing a lot of concert sounds and just working at venues around the city yeah did i see you were the lead engineer at uh nectar lounge when that yeah. I, obviously there's no shows happening right now <sighs> no no shows um, um but yeah between the two li live sound and studio work do you have a, a preference between the two and experience you prefer <laughs> yes i i love doing studio sound because I love being around the people and um, I just, it's just way more of a personal relationship than doing live sound. Although live sound is a personal relationship, to me, live sound has always been like, your goal is to um, make things fall apart the least, you know? Right. There's always going to be hiccups, but. Yeah. And, and another thing, I was talking to an engineer from the Bay Area um, yesterday actually and and something that he mentioned as well was like that i liked was that live sound there's no room for errors you know like it has to be perfect because that's the intention you know you want it to be the best perfect show that you can whereas like in the studio it's you make a mistake and something cool comes out of it and it and i oh, just sure. like that i like that aspect of recording as well yeah, like on a perfect night at like a live show, the best you can perform is where no one notices you're doing your job. Yeah, or totally. just like they don't know I'm here, just the band's killing it. Yeah, nobody's like looking back at the sound booth like, oh, what? can I hear the guitar? But I will say, 
you know, there's always going to be people that are, there's always something, you know. That's cool to hear that you were just talking with, uh, yeah, sound engineer buddy in San Francisco yesterday. Because to me, it seems like, kind of like you were alluding to, that being a sound engineer can be a solitary job when you're behind behind the desk at a live show. It's just kind of like you can't have other people be distracting you're obviously however many feet apart from the band it isn't as one-on-one as when you're in the studio and a lot of time the studio works you'll do a day of tracking and then you're mixing by yourself for a while too did you feel you have a community of other sound engineers or like maybe even um maybe even like mentors who look up to and ask advice or can bounce mixes off of for feedback you know i feel like in the bay area i had kind of more of a relationship with other engineers since i've been here in seattle it's i think kind of a little more um solitary for sure um but i will say there was like a i've always networked with engineers through like the grammy association um how how does that work so like when you're part of the grammy association um when you're a member of i i don't know what the what the official term is i'd have to look it up later but committee um, or whatever I'll, it's I'll like say the wrong grammy word for you. grammy association i think it's just called the grammy association i i don't know when you're part of the grammy associations um they have like events they have networking events and they have like you know sound check sound checks that you can go to for bands and and just like meet other engineers they have a lot of mixers industry mixers is what they are whereas here i feel like you know it's the Grammys aren't cool and nobody wants to go. So you would go to these events and what would you talk to these people about? Just music. I mean, it's just like, it's like going to a show to talk to a band to record them, but everyone wants to work with someone else. You know, it's like everyone is there to meet someone to work with them. So it's just like going and talking to people and finding out what they do and just being connected in that way. So if it's like, oh man i really need a background vocal for this project and it's like oh yeah i met a i met a vocalist last week at that thing like i'll call her or i'll call him you know right them yeah that sort of thing so So let's touch it so you spent you you started in san francisco is that where you grew up um yeah i grew up in the east bay area in antioch california and um yeah it was a pretty mellow place in I moved around a lot after that. And what brought you to Seattle specifically? What was it something about the music scene here or something else? Um, I had been here on a road trip, probably the summer before I moved here. Um, me and three other friends took a road trip around the country and just kind of went to like, um, like Austin and Nashville and Chicago and places like that. And we passed by here on the way home. And I think I was here two days and I was like, cool cool place and when i was moving here i was actually i was either going to move to indianapolis to get a to work at sweetwater.com oh cool yeah i I had interviewed with them and it was really cool and was that the purpose of the road trip for you guys to go like find some place was it we're escaping san francisco road trip or just buddies hanging out (laughs) it was (laughs) so at the time it was like let's go meet up with bands let's just like go take some videos let's interview bands and just see what they're doing and this was like 2014 and and i just like didn't really have any national connections really so i was just like cold calling bands and and national acts and stuff like that and trying to make that work but it was really hard to get bands to hang out and like do interviews which i think is kind of funny because it was like the purpose was to like promote them nationally um but we only met up with like a few bands and were they, that, that does surprise me because like I, we were joking earlier that every band wants to talk about themselves were they <laughs> skeptical of you for some reason did we say that um i don't know i don't know what it was i think i think yeah i think they they just didn't know because we didn't really have like a we didn't really start a youtube channel or podcast or anything like that we we didn't have any content prior oh, to see. that so it was just kind of like cold calling acts and being like hey like we're kind of doing this thing where we interview people around the country that we like and and just kind of compiling uh 
content list. Well, what happened to that project idea? Did you do anything with it? Um, no, it, it just, it didn't come out as cool as we thought. And part of it was like me being a host. And I guess after the fact, I was like, oh, this sucks. Like, I'm not, I, I, I was like being too much of a host and I just like didn't like that i wanted it to be more about the bands and and yeah and and we had like we had set up interviews with like a couple um like more popular bands um and like through the process they kind of decided they didn't want to do the interviews by the time we had gotten to their city which was kind of crappy but yeah of course um, you're traveling out there (laughs) part and for a big reason to see them and then they like out yeah so that's that was, a bummer it was kind of a bummer and you know it was i guess it was 50 50 we like did it with the intention to do that but in the end we were just like happy to to tour um the country and try and meet people but basically i ended up moving here because i just thought it was close enough where i could just pack all my stuff in my car and sleep in my car and if it doesn't work out like i can just drive back to the bay area and it wouldn't be a big deal are are there any it's a weird abstract question but i'm curious are there any oh, big diff, significant dip, uh similarities between the music scene in the bay area and seattle um similarities as or far as genre or whatever whether it's attitude of people playing around or just genre clichés i don't know i don't know i guess for me it's hard to compare the two. I think they're kind of different. Um, When I was starting to work more professionally in the Bay Area, it was kind of getting to that point where tech was starting to become a big deal and it like prices for rent were getting very expensive and kind of like all my music friends were moving to like Portland or LA, which I thought was funny. Um, (laughs) Right. and, And yeah, so it was kind of a weird time for sure. So I, I didn't really have a lot of friends in the music industry, like music friends in the Bay Area. Um, Here, I would say people just in general are nicer here than they are in the Bay Area. That's good to hear. They're just friendlier. Um, They're not like going out of their way to meet you. I I would say that um, they are kind of emotional mirrors to you. In Seattle. Yeah, would you feel that way? I feel that way about myself where if I'm interacting with someone, I, I don't know what it is about me, but I'll match the mood of somebody else. If someone, if I'm having a bad day, but someone comes in at a, a good hyper move, I mood, I, I find myself matching them pretty quick hmm. and the opposite happens too. I'll bring my kind of mood down, which is a bummer if I'm like in a great <laughs> mood and I'm talking yeah. to, this, yeah. Yeah, with, like um, emotional vampires where they'll kind of suck your <laughs> energy out. Exactly, for yeah. emotional vampires. Yeah. So yeah, I would say when I was when I first moved here, it was like, oh, I was really excited to be here. I was really happy to be in Seattle and just like kind of in a new place. And when I was happy to be around people and meet people, they reciprocated that like emotion. Oh, I, I feel that for sure. I I also moved here. You. I moved here summer 2014, and that was about the time you came out? I think I was here in April of 2015. So, so same, same time. Basically, eight-month window. Yeah. But yeah, I, the whole thing was I moved here right after college, and I don't know anybody here, and I'm trying to meet new people, make new friend groups. And in Seattle, everyone's a transplant, so you meet the other people looking to make new friends so and people are kind of on their best behavior they're being nice to try to <laughs> where you know, do you meet people. people mitch where did you meet people when you first moved here i i did go to a lot of concerts concerts um cause a- any concert you go to you have a big thing in common with everyone else in that room you all love this band for different reasons um so there's automatically something to talk about um that was the big thing because the jobs I was working, there weren't, there were just kind of odd jobs where there weren't other people around my age group or I, I wasn't, I didn't have any recurring. I wasn't like taking classes or anything here where you have regular input with people. Yeah. So any people I meet, I might think is cool. You may have a three minute interaction before you go on your own way. 
but I would be going to concerts and you see the same people at concerts sometimes. Yeah, totally. Uh, so if I saw someone just out of the corner of the room at one show but didn't talk to them, I may recognize them from a show I go to a week later and like, oh, I saw you at this show. Good for and you. And now you have someone else to talk about. Good. I was pretty good about being outgoing Good for you first. because I feel like, I mean, I don't know how most people feel about that, but I, I kind of like that. I kind of like that somebody that I've seen at a couple of shows would come out and be like, oh, yeah, I saw you at that show, you know, because I feel like I'm not that person anymore. Yeah, well, it's all I I'm a nerd who likes to get to shows early. I'll get there before the door even opens. <laughs> so you're waiting in line and you're just going to if you get to a show an hour or two hours before the door is open and you're in line with other people, you're just going to start talking to them. And I've a couple like I'd say only one of those people became like a close friend. But there are people I just have casual friendships with, and they're good people to know. I know if a certain band comes to town. I know when Animal Collective comes to town, I'm always going to see the same group of three people. We'll, we we don't even need... We won't talk beforehand. We'll just know we're going to be at the same show. Cool. And we find each other and hang out. It's That's it's awesome. Fun. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. That's too much about me. I want to get back to you. <laughs> um, I flipped the script. You we're did. interviewing you now. Turn the camera. I like having discussions, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, after some in-depth conversation, I'm going to ask you the most cliche question I'm sure everyone gets, but I don't really know. Um, analog versus digital. Like, do you have experience with both? What's your yeah. take, preference? Um, it is analog. Is there an extra hassle with it? Is it worth the hassle? I think yes. I think bands uh, just generally don't have the budget for that sort of time that it takes to do analog um but yeah i love analog i think just the process it of it is nice it's like there's little things that happen when you work on tape that are nice like um you have to rewind the tape and do that sort of thing or you have to like physically fast forward and rewind through tape which is just like moments of time where you get like a break you know sure where it's like oh cool like oh we could breathe and like maybe th something can come up whereas like digital is instant you know we're, we're not like we're not taking that moment to rewind the track and and re-record again you know so we it's just like go 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 yeah i mean you saw we just like record record oh you messed up okay record start over you know right. and you know and, and it goes both ways i mean like editing on digital is way easier and preferred for sure but the sound is better analog but just yeah. recording to tape or are there like analog um and like preamps or analog compression boxes or whatever that if yeah everything i mean when you're when you're recording to i mean i like analog tape when you're using a lot of analog gear i guess people talk about analog gear being like warm right yes it's like oh analog is so warm and digital is so cold and um yeah it's just just going through a lot of transformers and tubes and electronics and that kind of just rolls off that high end in a nice way or it distorts it you know it distorts the high end in a nice way um whereas digital just doesn't like pro tools doesn't do that but you know i guess people don't really know they don't realize like they're going through six steps of like uh trans like six transformers before they get to digital you know and, and oh sure and like you know some people plug right into their pro tools through their interface and they're like oh well why can't i get that sound you know or why why am i not getting that so yeah i mean both are cool they're different they both have their advantages and i i like them both i don't know what do you mean i like what am i supposed to say i thought i think that's a great answer <laughs> what am i supposed to say they're both good in their own ways I, I i figured to be some variation of that but i didn't know the details that there's advantages to both and why some may be preferable than others I, yeah. th I think the main thing is just um educating yourself in what exactly the gear is doing that you do like and trying to do that digitally yeah, um, a, a lot of people there, you were just saying earlier that you're mixing a record where the band recorded it at home and then they send it in to you. Yeah. Um, 
are there common trends that like because i i record at home and i i feel like i'm winging it a lot of the time i can sometimes get good sounds that i'm happy with but you as a professional um are there things you're like oh because they recorded at home they didn't get this right are there essential pieces of gear or just knowledge that more people need to have when they're um, doing it themselves i think the biggest the hardest thing about recording yourself is um you just can't really hear it correctly you know like you have your speakers in the room or or you have like your headphones but you're like just not hearing those low frequencies right and um and i guess yeah it's hard it's hard because i would say as an engineer the hardest thing i've had to learn is um listening <laughs> it's just hearing things as they are and try not to let what i think it's going to sound like affect what i'm actually hearing um and so you know yeah i think people like you know they get like a, a certain mic or a certain thing and they set it up in a certain way that like should work you know and then they do it and maybe they're hearing it a certain way and they're like yeah this is right and then i get it having no having not heard it previously and i go like oh like that's just like really bright, you know, or like, oh, that's really like low endy, you know, just because they're, I don't know, you know, like people. I can attest to that. We're just, if a band's been working with the same mic for years and years, and then all of a sudden they get something new, they're mistaking it sounding different as being better the things they, they want. Just like, it's like, oh, this is new. So that must mean the thing it's advertised as is working. I'm getting exactly what I want. Sure. But there's still nuances to where if you don't know how to use the equipment, you're not going to get the fullest you need out of it. Yeah, totally. I, I think last year I had some guy call me from Portland. He booked a session, a three hour session to record electric guitar here. And he booked it because he just wanted to see how to record electric guitar oh cool and and he came in and the first thing i did was just put a 57 in a cool place where i thought it would sound good um having having him play for a little bit and just putting the 57 where i thought it would sound best for what he was playing and we came in here and we turned it up and i was like yep that's it it sounds great and he's like it does sound good why the hell like why can't I do this at home? You know, it's yeah. like it, it really is just getting it to sound right in the room and getting a mic that compliments that. And yeah, just li listening, you know, it's, it's just listening and it's, that's the hardest part. And you know, we have a nice room. That's really important. Nice room, nice gear, nice instruments, nice amps. Like that's huge. That's huge. And getting like great sound. Nice stuff. Great sound. That's awesome. Uh, we're yeah. going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. <laughs> oh my God, we've been talking so long. And we're back with more Christian Escobar. Uh, so we are set up in Electro Kitty uh, right now. And you guys were ahead of the game a few years ago. I know you don't know what I'm talking about yet, but three years ago, you guys did a one-off live stream show on Twitch. Ooh, yeah. Where, where Senior Finn and Real Guy played. But you only did one of those that, that I tight. could find. Um a lot of people are doing live streams now yeah. in the COVID world. Has that been a conversation? You guys have any interest in bringing that back? Well, yeah, I guess there's kind of, since COVID has been happening, there's been a lot of like, well, I mean, what do we, how comfortable are we just having random people coming in and, and doing that sort of thing? But yeah, I, I enjoyed that process. Um, but I will say that, when it comes to doing things that that was kind of like my idea i brought that into the studio and i was like hey we should do this i really like these bands i i would like to do my idea was <laughs> was that i would like to do a thing where i have my favorite bands come and play and you take video as if you were like at a show or at a party like you know first person like i'm at this show i, I want to like hang here you know be around other people and you know, just make it a comfort, comfortable thing. And, you know, we like had Senior Fiend come, we had Real Guy come, and we just like invited all their friends, which happened to be my friends too. And, and we, you know, we had beer and we just had a good time. And, and that was the intention. And, and it came out really good. But after that, 
um, we talked to like the head engineer and the owner of the studio. And the big thing was like, well, who are we going to have next? Like, um, it, it was hard to think, figure out like how we could do something consistently with bands that we truly, really, really like and have it be cool every time. And I wanted it to be really cool. And to me, like almost perfect, you know, and, I wouldn't say I'm a perfectionist, but I feel like I try and have really high standards for that sort of thing. And I guess, yeah, around that time, too, I was noticing, like, other people were kind of starting to do that same thing, too. And that was kind of like a buzzkill for me. I was like, well, let them do it. You know, I... I Rip, but you... I Because I, I watched it for... And I think you're right. It did come out really well, especially just for a pilot, almost a testing. Like, let's try this and see how it works. It came out great. You got great sound and video and obviously it was a fun vibe yeah there I, obviously a lot of work goes into that so i'm not saying like you have to do that again <laughs> but i think you guys did a cool thing just like because people were doing that out of their houses or small things but doing it out of a professional recording studio adds a layer of coolness and professionalism it'd be especially when like the seattle music scene isn't doing a whole lot right now some bands are still releasing things but you can't tour and promote behind it a, a lot of the normal press routes you do you can't do so yeah i'm just putting that into the universe it'd be a, <laughs> it, you had fun yeah. doing it. it was your idea it'd be a kind of a cool thing to do again i, I would mean, enjoy seeing it i could say it was my idea but i feel like it's people have been doing that sort of thing for kind of a long time I even like i worked at a studio in san francisco called studio sq mm -hmm. and when i first like interned there it was like the studio manager sierra and the head engineer um jeremy like they were having hang nights basically where yeah they would have a band come play they didn't like do filming or live stream or anything but it was like yeah let's call lagunitas because they're in petaluma which is like close to san francisco right and it was like let's call lagunitas let them know that we're having a party and they'll give us like a bunch of free beer and we'll just have a hang with cool bands and and so yeah that's where that kind of came from obviously to do this thing but I think I, I agree with you. I think post COVID who knows what, what's going to happen, but I, I'm very, I'm very much pushing for local music activism, I guess. Yeah. Where like, you know, you think about like the nineties or two thousands, like when Seattle was music city, you know, and it's like, you think like sub pop would put on all these like events and like major label rec like would put on event like live events and and i think it'd be really cool to do that sort of thing where you have more stuff like that where it's like um what's what's the word what's the word i'm looking for that's like um not catered but like uh when people talk about like taste like a kind of oh curated a curated you know set of bands like put together for this cool show. yeah you guys have a whole roster of great bands who have come in and recorded here and i'm sure you could go through your favorite ones and be like hey would you want to come and do this <laughs> yeah yeah that'd be really cool and i i think there's a lot of good bands in seattle um and i think it would be really cool to create some sort of cohesive thing going but who knows we'll yeah. see it's work to do but yeah yeah it's work to do and and we'll see but i did really enjoy hanging out with senior fiend i love that band and i love all those people and i love real guy and i think he'll probably release a record who knows when but hopefully another one because the first one is awesome it's a great record i think i think he did a great job same with senior fiend uh Anyways. let's do another question about you oh yeah um yeah, we were talking that like I was I tried to do research for these and there isn't a whole lot about you on Google to dig up. Mm. One thing I was able to dig up was your old Twitter profile, which you haven't used in like three years. Oh god. I didn't I didn't go sorting through tweets, but your bio <laughs> I probably have like three tweet tweets. I, I didn't even look to be honest. <laughs> I, I stopped at your bio that said recording engineer and pretend guitar player. Oh yeah. To tell me about the music you play. Uh you still <laughs> play music because you just showed me the new guitar you just bought. Oh um well, I haven't played in a band since 2010. Well, what kind of band was it like? How serious did you take it? What it, was the name oh, that you could name? I like all the stuff I want to know. It was it was tough. It was like um 
my best friend played drums. I think it was like my three best friends at the time. You know, it was like guitar, bass, drums, me. Um, so where I grew up in the Bay Area, in the East Bay, there was like a big like hardcore rock and roll scene, you know. And um, I think w- w- I was kind of late to the game. I didn't get a guitar until I was. My brother bought me my first guitar when I turned 15, and I feel like I was kind of late to the game. But I spent a majority of my high school years pretty much just sitting at home playing guitar all day every day i would come home from school and i would play guitar all day um like cover songs yeah i mean for the most part i was playing by myself until 2009 you know so like four or five four years of just like playing emo rock songs like my chemical romance and stuff like that um but um yeah, I guess that's funny. Sorry to get off topic, but I love it. That is one thing I will say the biggest difference between being in the Bay Area and being here is that like when you talk to people who grew up grew up here, it's like, oh, we love like Built to Spill. Um <laughs> and I can't think of other bands off the top of my head. Um but like that sort of thing. I right? will say Nirvana is not just a cliche. Like there's a lot of love and pride in Nirvana here. Sure, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um like built to spill modest mouths yep um others in that genre that i can't even think of the name but in the bay area smith out of portland right elliot smith in the bay area i feel like it's well i can't speak for the bay area for the east bay area where i grew up i feel like the bands i listened to were were not the bands that people listen to here you know i even feel weird saying like Oh, I listened to like a lot of Coheed and Cambria or like a lot of Lincoln Park, you know? Oh yeah. I know that was what we were listening to in the Midwest. Sure. It, yeah. Just, yeah. We're, I don't know. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I'm, I'm, what, what? Tell me. No, I'm, I'm just agreeing <laughs> with your, your experience. I feel so like you were, you were saying you were playing these songs. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Playing and, guitar, building up your chops. Right. Building up my chops and, um, and yeah. And so we, we played in kind of a rock band um stupid names i i'm so bad at, thinking back on it now i was not very good you know i i was talented in my ability to play but in my musical ability i definitely like hit a point where i just didn't know why i wasn't getting better and didn't know i could you know how i could expand my mind musically um, so after 2009, 2010, I kind of got into engineering. I like got into doing studio stuff more. My buddy had a studio. So th- this is the point I, I'm curious about because I, one of my good friends, we started playing together in a band like in like eighth grade or freshman year of high school. And he kind of fell out of playing music similar to yourself, but like he started recording music because he wanted to record himself. Is that what, how you kind of got the bug? You wanted to record yourself and you found yourself being interested in yeah um, yeah sorry sorry to interrupt i'm no that, I, that's I'm trying to think about how how it went yeah um we play in a band and my really good friend joe saya his dad frank had a home studio and his dad was like you know the cool dad like the single dad who just like loved music and doing he like played piano really well and um that's like where my band went to like go record ourselves basically when we first when we first started and and he wasn't into like the kind of music that we played so he was basically like you know here's the studio figure it out like whatever i'm i'm just gonna be in the tv uh, on the tv in the living room watching tv like whatever um and so yeah so one of us had to figure out how to record us and that ended up being me and yeah and i just liked it so much i liked it and i would say i like that i was able to control everything which is weird to say we i was like really i really wanted to be successful playing music like i really wanted to be um i not well known i didn't want to be like famous but i like you know i wanted to write good music that people were into i feel like right and do you still do that do you like write at home and just keep it to yourself? I, I hadn't really. I've really just engineered in the last, you know, eight ten years since. And then that's then. brought you the happiness. 
Yeah, and I and I really loved engineering. It it was never like it didn't feel like oh I couldn't I couldn't be a musician. I'm I'm gonna be an engineer or, or like. It just was interesting to me. I guess with the band thing, it was like I was practicing every day, and it was really hard to like get the band to practice because like you know we're 17 18 years old or 19 years old and just like want to do teen teen young young adult stuff i I don't know i don't i don't know what everyone is doing but you know it kind of got to the point where i was like yeah i like engineering because i don't have to like you know worry about coming in the next practice and be like well did anybody play their instrument you know (laughs) you know and yeah and that's kind of where i got into that and and I kind of gave up playing music for a long time. But I did buy that guitar. I bought a Gibson SG, which is like one of my dream guitars. And I was telling Jesse Boteo earlier, your bandmate, um, that although I haven't played guitar in eight years, when I picked it up and started playing, I was better than when I, when I left off because of all the things I've learned engineering and just how I hear things and how I understand how playing works, if that makes sense. Oh, totally. Just things I've read, stuff like that, and stuff that I deal with when I work with musicians all the time. And and yeah, and so I think my goal is to write music again and play music and do these awesome things where it sounds really good because I'm an engineer and hopefully is cool because... I've been around so many cool musicians. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to hear the Christian Escobar solo album coming out <laughs> 2022, 2023. It's not going to be called the Christian Escobar solo album. That's for sure. No, but, you, you, you well, got a good name. Yeah. I don't know what the name will be. I, that's my one thing I'm bad at. The The name will be hard. Even harder will be the album cover. Hell yeah. It'll be hard because I'll be like <laughs> with a gold chain. I'll yeah. be like bent over like this and I'll be like You gotta like stroke your chin or I'll something. I'll be like yeah. oiled up. <laughs> no. I won't be on the cover. It'll be it'll definitely be a band project and Oh, and I in my last band I was singing and playing guitar. Oh, we didn't talk about the sing. Oh, that's cool. And I have decided I only want to play guitar. That's that's <laughs> a sweet spot. Yeah. For sure. Right. Totally. So it won't be about me. It'll be about someone else. And I'll just play really cool guitar Hell and yeah. engineer it. <laughs> well, I'm so happy you got your dream guitar. Um, we were talking that you you were having a really hard time coming up with a show and tell item. So we, we could either like tell a story or we could just talk about your guitar. You seem really inspired by that <laughs> right now. Or um, like you, you, you seem to have a cool story about, uh, not cool, just like an interesting story. I'm talking too much, but no, you're not talking enough yeah we can just edit all that out anyways yeah no. oh it's all staying in <laughs> um hmm. about uh, about why a show and tell item was hard for you to think of okay. yeah just talk about that well i when i moved to the, here i basically moved up here with like 400 bucks and my car And I had my sleeping bag in the trunk of the car and I was like, I'm moving up there and I don't really have anywhere to stay, but I'm going to sleep in my car and it'll be fine. And so I didn't really, that was kind of like my shedding of everything, you know? And so I just kind of since then, I've kind of been like that where I just, I don't have a lot of things because I just don't feel like I need them. Um... Because, you know, I I came here in my car. I just had enough room in my car to do that. And then I lived in a hostel. I, like, worked at a hostel in Fremont. And there just, like, wasn't a lot of space. And then I, like, moved into a, like, a, a house, like, a college house where I was, like, sharing one bedroom with, like, another person. So there oh, was... You have, a... like, the curtain set up between you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, it was kind of a cool room where it was, like when you opened the door it was like his half of the room but there was like a doorway without a door and then it was like another small room so we shared a room but we were like in the same room you know there's this the same entryway to the room yeah i almost ended up in a few of those houses when i first moved here yeah yeah i i toured in some and yeah 
Yeah. So it, yeah, if you're with the right people, can totally be a good vibe. Right. And and it was it was pleasant because it allowed me to um, move out of like the hostel, which was also pleasant. I loved working at the hostel. Um, but it allowed me to become more of like a resident of Seattle and kind of do my own thing. But I will say. Okay, so yeah, so I, I don't really have a thing, I guess, but in the three days that I've been trying to think of something, I was like, well, okay, well, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I would say that's like, I've failed a lot. I've failed so many times that it's been hard, you know? And so like, one of the things that I try and do is think about like um you know the things that make me successful and try and and i'm and i want to share that you know like so like one of the things i think about constantly and that helps me a lot is that um my dad would always he was very strict he like um he like always wanted me to do things right the first time and so like he would be really tough on me and like you know get pretty mad at me if if like i was just like half-assing something or you know there was definitely like a lot of times where i would like bring my homework for him to check you know and be like dad here's my homework and he would just be like you can't read this or you know like your handwriting's bad like do it right like just do it right the first time and um i think that's just um I don't know. I don't know if that's like just um, the culture. I think being um, he's from Guatemala and my mom's from Mexico. So like I think he that's just how he was raised. And so that's just how he raised me. And so, yeah, at the time it was like really hard. And I was like a shitty kid where I'm like, fuck this, you know, but yeah. sorry, I don't know if I can say bad words. You totally can. OK, it, it sounds like he had opportunities to coach and inspire and instead kind of put extra pressure I, I yes and i think he was pretty strict and my sister would say he was the least strict with me of of all of us are which, you the youngest is that why i'm i am the youngest of like my with my dad and my mom and i have a younger half brother okay so i'm the youngest of our family um and my dad was great and he gave me a lot of opportunities for sure but i think i think that's really grown on me you know at the time it was tough and it sucked but I think for sure I think it's so important just to do things right the first time and like really you know even if it's something you're really not that into like it's really important to just like hone hone it in and bring it in and like focus on getting it done because if you do it right the first time you'll get something that everyone is happy with and that you're happy with and you don't end up having to redo it a bunch of times and and just like have this garbage product or whatever it is that you're doing and it it just alleviates a lot of stress i guess in the long run though it was stressful learning that lesson i think it's a big lesson for me that i want to share with you i love that that's that that's a really nice philosophy and kind of speaking about it in the abstract i'm curious no is was there a recent moment where you maybe tried something new and you and you had that philosophy running through your mind where like i'm doing this i want to get it right it, can you think of a recent time that happened how, oh, it, how it applied i mean i it's everything it's it's like every i feel like almost every day you know um i i deal with it a lot because like when you're mixing someone else's music or you know just like doing anything music related I would say like editing is tiresome. It's like not something that's fun to do as an engineer, like having to edit someone who had a hard time with something that they could have maybe practiced. Anyways, I don't know. But you know what I mean? Like editing is, it's work. That's the, to me, the least fun part of being a sound engineer. It's not creative. You're just fixing mistakes. You right. don't get to add. Yeah. Exactly. I totally feel that. And so it's like, in that sense, you know, there's so many times where I'm like editing something and it's like you're very anytime that there's an opportunity for you to like be lazy about something. I, I'm always thinking like I just got to do it right, because as soon as I forget that, 
I immediately know that that was like the mistake that I made and I have to f redo it, you know, twice or three times and, and it becomes way more of a burden or like, you know, with recording, it's like, you know, put in that, put in that extra effort rehearsing it, like put in the time that it takes to really learn what you're trying to do before you do it. Because then when you go to record it, like, yeah, like you're, you're, you're afforded a little more leeway because you're not like trying to fix these little things that are just mistakes from n not practicing you know you're like you have this extra you know time and and feeling to just expand on what you're doing instead of like just trying to get it right you know if that makes sense does that make sense it totally does <laughs> you're looking for reassurance i was just looking at you it, it makes sense I, I mean yeah i think that's super yeah yeah i'm as you're telling that stories are going through my head of like, all right, was I doing it right the first time? Was I taking the extra effort? It's a really good, smart philosophy to have. And, and not just music, it applies everywhere. It, it applies kind of a lot, you know? And I think you don't really realize that that's happening until, you know, you are doing something again. And, and yeah, and, and I will say, although it's something that I truly believe and try and strive to do every day in my life, you know, I, I screw it up all the time. I, I make a lot of mistakes in my life. And you, you said you failed a lot. Failure is informative. You, yeah. You learn from it. There's if, if you're willing to learn, for sure. Right. People make a lot of mistakes and, and you know, push it away or, you know, blame it on someone else or sure. something else, you know. But I agree. Well, I like how philosophical this got. Christian, thank you so much for being uh, my guest today. Yeah, no uh, That was a really nice thank show you. and tell. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, la last word is yours. Any sh like plugs you want to give? If people do want to get in touch with you to work with you or hear your work, what's the best way to get in touch? Oh, you could just email the studio at electrokitty.com, I think it is. I don't think it's Electric Kitty Recording. Electrokitty.com. Yeah. Google Electric Kitty will come up. Um, yeah, you can get in touch with me that way or... You can message Mitch and we can get in touch. And yeah, if you have music that you care about and you want someone who will also care about it, just hit me up. I mean, I want to help you do cool shit. I, I can personally attest. This is only the second day I've worked with Christian. We did some tracking months ago. And my, my first day working with you, you, you brought a really nice, fun attitude. And, and I think we all learned thing me being interested in learning how to record better uh yeah i learned just from watching you and i like that you were you wanted to make obviously we're all working to make a great product but you cared about the experience well one thing i thought was really fun when you came to our rehearsal space to record us is you brought your own camera and you said like guys take pictures document the process have fun uh and then but don't look at the pictures like don't don't take a picture and then look at it and delete things. Just leave them, and then it'll be a nice surprise <laughs> afterwards. And I thought that was a really nice philosophy to have. Like, have fun in the moment as you're doing this. Making music is stressful. Yeah. It, you you go from having an idea in your head that you care a lot about. The, the idea in your head is perfect, and you can only mess it up in the execution. It, like, it, it's stressful. It, it, that happens all the time. So having fun during the process and christian was great to work with <laughs> i appreciate you saying that um yeah i think i just want the best of you and it's not it's not my record so the, what i can do to help you comfortable and enjoyable and com be as communicative as possible so that you can relay how you want it to be then i think we all end up happy in the end well, thank you so much for chatting. Cool. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right. Later. <laughs>